Hi, and welcome to Take Every Thought Captive, our weekly look at the Catholic intellectual tradition and an exploration of the author's books and topics that have shaped Catholic thinking for 2,000 years. I'm Dr. Richard Bolzakelli, lecturer in theology at Catholic Studies Academy, in for Jason Gale. And I'm joined this week by Dr. Benjamin Smith, our lecturer in philosophy. And today we'll be talking about Americans, uh, American ideas of freedom in connection with some concepts from his recently published book, Understanding Modern Political Ideas. Now, before we get started, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to our channel and select notifications. And of course, share this content with your friends. So Dr. Smith, as we get started, let me just throw out an observation. It seems to me that for many Americans, certain concepts of freedom are seen as kind of ahistorical, but mm -hmm. that's not really the case, is it? No, it's not. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a good observation. You know, there's a, a really strong distinction I think you find. And it, it, we know about this distinction in, in, in the history of philosophy, but between sort of the more kind of um, abstract, a priori, deductive kind of thought that you get in the uh, kind of French tradition, mm -hmm. um, uh, even the French modern tradition, right? Uh, and the more empirically minded experience uh, you know, focused um, uh, thought that you get in the sort of Anglo-American tradition. And that bears out in a, like in epistemology, but also bears out actually in uh, political philosophy uh, as well. And I think, you know, in America, one thing that we often, we often kind of, you know, we read the Declaration of Independence, which is a beautiful document, of course, wonderful uh, rhetoric there. But we kind of sometimes just kind of, it just kind of hangs in the air, right? Mm -hmm. As if you know Jefferson speaks it out of from from nowhere, and and then everybody agrees, right? And because it's just so obvious, right, or something like that. But really, it's got a long, there's a long history behind it, um, and it's good to know that history in order to understand the kind of freedom that um, the American founders were going for, the kind of freedom that. Uh, we, you know, fought for in the War of Independence, the kind of freedom that we won. Um, and I want to say, you know, it, it, it's, its first root actually is in the English tradition, which shouldn't be surprising, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, my, my children are very pro-Irish, which means that uh, they're, they're, very, they're very kind of hard on the English uh, sometimes, uh, I guess for understandable reasons. But, the, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I tell them, you know, you know, in a sense, you know, Amer all Americans are kind of English in a, in, a, in a sense, right? In the sense that, you know, it, you know, the Dutch lost. These aren't the Dutch colonies. These were the English uh -huh. colonies, right? And, you know, the vast majority of them were founded under a, uh, you know, an English royal uh, charter. Uh, and, um, you know, nobody disputed, none of the colonists disputed, uh, say, the generation prior to the War of Independence. None of them would have disputed were they if uh, they were subjects of the king. They would have said, you know, and a lot of them would have called themselves Englishmen. You know, when, when Paul Revere rides through the town, he didn't say the British are coming. He said the regulars are coming, right? Because yeah, right, they, they all kind of thought of themselves as Englishmen, right? Or uh -huh. Roman, right? Um, it's hard to remember that, right? Uh, to yeah. Some, you know, uh, but right. I think it's important. And one advantage of, of remembering that is we, we can bring Edmund Burke into the discussion. And mm -hmm. Burke's a really interesting guy because everybody recognizes him as the father of modern conservatism, right? But he was around and active at this time, right? And commenting on present uh, events and was actually serving in parliament. He wasn't a Tory, interestingly enough, he was a Whig, um, but was the father of conservatism, modern conservatism too. And interestingly, he was very pro-colonist, <laughs> right? He thought that the Brits were abusing the colonist um, and that if, if, the, uh, if, the, if the crown ha would just recognize them as having tr the, uh, the traditional rights of Englishmen, yeah, things right. would sort of settle themselves out. Yeah, that, that that's the interesting part of it, isn't it? Right. I mean, like mm -hmm. they were they were fighting for what they believed were the rights of Englishmen. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So right. if they had, I mean, this is actually really fascinating because today, if you if you were to hear the typical, think of the typical slurs, right? Today. Um, against political abuses they'll say he's acting like a king right right sometimes they'll right. say dictator maybe yeah, but right. but but very often they'll say king and they'll they'll mm -hmm. sort of they'll they'll chide somebody's being king such and such right <laughs> right 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 and um and that wasn't actually the problem was it i mean that 
No. But even John from their Locke, point of view. Yeah, even John Locke, you know, doesn't have a problem per se with monarchy, right? Uh, his his problem is with monarchical usurpations, right? Yeah, that right. Is the usurpation of rights that actually uh, belong to the people or to the various estates, say in, in an English system. Yeah. Um, so, so, so let me, so let, I want to be really clear on this. Okay. Cause this is actually, this is one of the really fascinating things about the disconnect between contemporary American conservatives and the actual founding of the country. Right. right. Um, so we tend to think today, that monarchy is an absolute dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is that historically that is false. That's not how it was originally understood. That's right. I think both in England and in America, right? Uh, I mean, there were of course, there were of course some real, real radicals in England and in America who rejected monarchy you know, in itself, but they were a marginal group. Uh -huh. um, the the vast majority, um, you know, saw you know monarchy like say in England, you know, they have a kind of a mixed regime uh, as just part of you know the way you do things. What was important to them were was uh, were their rights, right? Their ability mm -hmm. to govern themselves, their ability to be able to do what their fathers had done, right? Yeah, that right. sort of thing, um, and and live in that way. So I think it's important to think you know to realize the War of Independence. Um, was not a war for democracy, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't anti <clears throat> It was a, a war for traditional rights, um, which is really key. And again, Edmund Burke just saw this very clearly um, and saw that if King, you know, if the King George had just treated the colonists as uh, Englishmen, that the, most of the problem would have gone away. Um, you even see in the um, the debates in the Continental Congress, right? They go on and on. They off, They try over and over and over again to come to peace with the king. It's almost like the king wanted a fight, you know? And, that, uh, and that's, and that's the, the whole litany is in the Declaration of Independence. That's right. That's right. Yes, yes. It's so interesting, right? Because they lay out this long case. They know to themselves and to the nations that they have to make a case for Yeah, you can't breaking. just up and declare yourselves independent. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, that uh, I believe the language of the declaration is something along the lines of, you know, when, when two peoples have been bound together for a very long time, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's necessary that they lay out their reasons for uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> separating. And so they're making a case and the case is really about things like uh, billeting troops. That sounds weird to us. Right. But it's a big deal. It's, uh, you know, pressing uh, men into uh, uh, service, uh, all those sorts of things. Right. Um, that traditional Englishmen weren't supposed to be subject to, if that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I think as an understanding American freedom then, one thing we have to understand is what it did have kind of in the background, and we'll talk about this a little bit with Locke and Thomas Reed, a universal appeal, it was also very particular, right? It was mediated through custom, right? It was mediated through history and tradition. And that means that for, the, for Americans, right, one of the reasons we have freedom, one of the reasons we celebrate freedom is because of tradition, right? Which, you know, for us then, should we should kind of see like that tradition and custom and freedom are not opposed, right? Actually, our, our freedom is a custom proper to kind of the Anglo-American tradition. Yeah, right. This is how we live. This is how we do things. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you're 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 sort of free, right? You're free to live as you always had, right? Mm -hmm. You're free to you're free to conduct your life um, in the manner to which you've become uh, accustomed. That's right. Yeah. Right. That's exactly. over generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is interesting, right? Because today, on the opposite side of conservatism, <laughs> right? right, on the progressive side, mm -hmm. that concept right there is is under severe attack right that's right that's right yeah yeah freedom i think for progressives is almost a a, a unattached proposition right it just kind of floats out there and it can really be used to justify pretty much anything right actually like oddly right it seems to me and mm -hmm. from my observations that it can be their concept of freedom is used to justify tyranny. Yeah, it's a. Mm -hmm. I, 
how to square that circle is, a, is interesting. <laughs> it's really fascinating i mean it's it's this unmitigated kind of uh liberty right and it's interesting john adams a very astute observer as was edmund burke of the french revolution and both burke and john adams you know wrote very strongly against the french revolution um which is interesting right because you know you you would th there were of course some americans who support of the French Revolution. But, you know, the, the establishment for the most part didn't. Um, and that's because they saw it as extreme. They saw it as this kind of destructive freedom, right? A mm -hmm. kind of freedom that involves a kind of anarchy that then kind of becomes tyranny, right? You know, I mean, we think about Plato's uh, de uh, devolution of regimes, right? Eventually you get all the way down to anarchy, right? And then tyranny, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's interesting, but I think it's it's free to be Englishmen, right? I think, and I, I don't want to overstress that, but I think it is actually important. It's free to act in a way that you have inherited through this particular tradition. Mm. It means that it's a kind of freedom from its beginning that it is not limitless, right? it's already couched in English common law and English custom, right? So I, I think going back into the, into the philosophical tradition, right? Mm -hmm. You can see that um, there's always been some concept of freedom for human sure. beings, mm -hmm. some sort of idea of moral self-determination or something, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, but it's also been recognized that it isn't limitless. That's right. And, and so it, given that, we're finite beings we're contingent beings right mm -hmm. there's always some parameter within which freedom is a possibility for us mm -hmm. um it, it, in other words it's it's not but there are concepts of freedom today i think that are that are highly under underdeveloped in people's sure. minds but they right. they sort of in a knee-jerk way um just appeal to them as if freedom could exist in a complete vacuum, unreferenced to anything but their own will or something, right? right? Yeah, sure. Uh, and um, and and that's a that's historically like nobody, hardly anyone ever thought that. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and and when they did, I mean, you could kind of see disaster, right? Like in the French Revolution, right? Uh, right. <laughs> that, that's a disaster I mean, situation. Why, why, why are adults free but children aren't? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it it's because adults have learned to govern themselves within the That's bounds right. of reason, presumably, right. right? Yes, yes. Whereas children are subject to their mm -hmm. own urges. Mm -hmm. And that's not actually freedom. It's not. Yeah. Like, it's impossible to be free that way. That's that's actually that's the way animals are. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's right in line with the way, uh, you know, um, uh, John Adams, Edmund Burke, but also John Locke and Thomas Reed mm -hmm. are thinking about it, right? Is that freedom is something that we have through our reason, right? Um, and so it's not limitless, right? So you can appeal, I think, either to custom to see how it's not limitless, right? Um, or to, um, you know, philosophy and look at sort of the, the idea that our freedom's grounded in our rationality, right? So the more rational we are, the freer we are. You know, the, the, the less rational we are, the less free we are. Um, that's certainly, I think, what the, the founders uh, uh, had in mind uh, when they think about the United States. So to the modern push, the contemporary push toward emotivism, mm -hmm. you would say is a bad thing. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It's actually antithetical to genuine freedom. Uh -huh. It's antithetical to American freedom, to the American idea of freedom. Actually, uh -huh. um, there's a there's a there's this there's a kind of a view of some that have developed, uh, you know, sort of on the right. I would, I would call it kind of the the radical view, or maybe sometimes in a Catholic context we'd call it the call it integralism, right? that really, I think, misunderstands <laughs> the American tradition on liberty, right? Uh -huh. uh, and they, they tend to think that it's this sort of wide open, um, disordered, objectless, um, sheer willing, okay? And it really isn't. That's just, that's just, that's just a uh, misrepresentation of the actual uh, facts. I used to kind of be fairly sympathetic to that intergross critique of America, but the more I read, the more I realized it's just, it's just inaccurate, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's not it's just what they actually believe. It's, it's yeah. not what they actually thought, you know? It's a plausible hypothesis until you read more, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and I can see why it's attractive because if you say, oh, this is the problem with America, right? Is we have this kind of 
voluntarist idea of freedom that you can choose whatever you want. Uh, you know, you can make up your own meaning for life, that sort of thing. If that were the case, right, then yeah, I mean, that, that is a big problem. But at least historical, traditional American freedom uh, isn't like that. Right. So, um, and I mean, that, that is, it's an important point to make, right? Because mm -hmm. actually a lot of people today who call themselves conservatives do sort of have this voluntarist understanding. Oh. Um, and, and, and that needs to be, that actually needs to be corrected. And if right. we're going to defend, if we're going to defend this American thing with any kind of, with any sort of, um, credibility, right. Mm -hmm. I think, and it's under assault, let's not pretend it isn't correct. Um, then we need to get it right. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it seems to me we need to be defending what, what they actually, um, what they actually try to establish. Uh, if indeed that's a good thing. Sure. And I, I think it seems to me that it is a pretty good thing. Um, that, I, I want to talk a little about one of the more problematic ideas, though. Okay. For In the minds of contemporary critics, right? Mm -hmm. We have this phrase uh, in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. And many people will say, um, they'll point out, well, doesn't that really trace back to an earlier uh an earlier phrase life liberty and the pursuit of property mm -hmm. uh and if that's the case i mean isn't it just that you'll often hear people in the conservative side say you know that uh, to be american is to be capitalist mm. um that's a phrase that i that, that's a saying i don't particularly like and the mm -hmm. reason i don't like it is because uh, I think the definition of the term capitalist is something that we don't all agree on mm -hmm. uh, and it can be misleading. Sure. And I think when people say it, they have this sort of gross concept of the accumulation of absolutely as much wealth as you could right. possibly right. have um, as much as you like right. with absolutely no limit and no responsibility to anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think that's what life, liberty, and pursuit of property actually meant, but mm -hmm. am I wrong or right about that i think you're 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 absolutely uh, correct about that you know um Locke is a controversial figure uh to, in you know he was when he was alive and he still is today um but you know uh, i think you know to give to to give Locke his due right you know he does not see limitless acquisition as the point of private property uh -huh. the point of private property is to secure our liberty Right. Right. Uh, that's the point of private property. And they could say, OK, well, so you can do so you have properties, so you can do whatever you want. No. <laughs> OK. And, and, you know, Locke says a lot, almost too much about happiness. Like he's he, he's very voluminous writer. You know, some writers are very concise and, you know, he's kind of more of a uh, he writes in kind of an almost a kind of exploratory way. Right. It takes a long time to get around to what he's supposed to say. Um, but he. You know, he's very clear, I think, that, you know, he does associate happiness with a kind of pleasure. And if you just stop reading there, you think, well, he's a hedonist, right? Uh -huh. um, but he's actually not, right? Because he distinguishes between um, true pleasure for a human and false pleasure for a human, right? And, and the true pleasure is based on the perfection of a rational nature. He says so explicitly. Um, and so, you know, you might, want to, you might want him to be clearer, right, in, in what he had said. But it's certainly the case that um, he thinks of happiness as being consistent with reason, right? And you know, he's not he's not ignorant of the classical tradition. All of these guys, all you know, most of the founders were very well read uh in uh Greek philosophy, right? And so, you know, they they were aware of this idea of happiness as eudaimonia. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't necessarily know, I wouldn't necessarily want to go so far as to say that they exactly meant what Aristotle meant or what Cicero might would have might, but but something in the ballpark, right? Uh, yeah, they could have like been part that. of that conversation. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, um, it's not the case uh, that property is uh, something um, that's to be pursued in a limitless way. In fact, John Adams or for says, its own sake. That's right. Yeah. 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 And in fact, John Adams explicitly says that if if our if our republic comes to be peopled by uh, by by those who are subject to avarice, that we're doomed. <laughs> right? oh. So he presupposes, right, that a republic will not be, right, uh, people uh, avaricious, right? And this really goes back to, um, I mean, there's a long thought, a long 
tradition of thinking about what is a republic in the classical world, right? And uh, it's a Greek conversation and a Roman conversation. Um, and it's really fascinating, uh, you know, at some point I'd love to, to do a book or a class just on tracing ancient republicanism, right? Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, you know, different views about what it, what is a republic and what does it take to maintain one, right? And certainly a lot of those ancient authors thought that um, extreme wealth was actually problematic right, <laughs> for a republic. And I think the, 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 the founders shared that view. Good. Okay. So th th I mean, it's interesting, right? Because, mm. because that's one of the, it seems to me that's one of the really sort of, well, it strikes me as sort of a cheap critique, right? Against, mm -hmm. against the American founding is that, right. well, hidden beneath this pursuit of happiness ideas, this pursuit of property thing. So it's really all about greed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's not, that's just not true. You're not understanding mm -hmm. the point. So the right. point you said was for private property, right? The pursuit of property was was to secure our liberty, right? That's or right. Or to basically to provide for ourselves and yeah, to provide for ourselves, to give ourselves the instruments and the resources with which to govern our lives, right? Um, you know, um, uh, if you're wanting to if you're wanting to educate yourself, you need to have access to books that you can have on yourself and you can read over and over again, right? right. If you want a few chickens your... in the backyard doesn't That's hurt. Right. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, you got to stay alive. Uh, you need to, you know, support your wife and children and those sorts of things. Right. So you need, you know, you're, you're, you are free to pursue the good of family life, but of course, family life has certain prerequisites. So you're free, your freedom to pursue that presupposes that you have the stuff, right. Or at least yeah, access right. to the stuff that will allow you to, to have a family life. So it's not a limitless, it's not liberty for the sake of property. It's property for the sake, for the sake of, liberty. of liberty. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so actually this is interesting because um, I've had this concept, uh, I, I've had this sort of critique today of modern living mm -hmm. where um, like right now I live in a development with an HOA. Mm. Um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't avoid it. Uh, I tried, <laughs> trust me. Uh, and, um, and I look, you know, I have this tiny piece of, property that goes along with the house all these developments have these postage stamp yards right mm -hmm. um there's not a lot you can do agriculturally in it and actually if you even <coughs> try um uh, uh -huh. you know you'll you'll get into <coughs> some trouble so um <coughs> you, you like i can't have chickens in my backyard no no one of the one of the things that i one of the things that really strikes me about the contemporary way of mm -hmm. living in the united states is um, is that property no longer seems to serve the purpose uh, of um, of establishing liter uh, establishing uh, liberty for us? In, in other mm -hmm. words, I there's this concept called uh, you know partial taking, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where the government essentially says, well, you can kind of you can own this, but you can't do anything with it. You're not allowed mm -hmm. to do this. You're not allowed to do that. You can't put a building here. You can't. Mm -hmm. You can't have chickens. Mm -hmm. um, it's partial taking of the mm -hmm. property. And it, it seems to me that that concept is a little antithetical mm -hmm. to, to what the founders would have had in mind as far as the purpose of owning it in the first place. Right, right. Yeah, sure. I think that's probably right. I think, uh, I mean, property rights are probably one of the things that has been eroded the most <clears throat> in uh, American life. Uh, you know, I mean, there are other things, but certainly I think, you know, when I, when I look at America <clears throat> and when I talk about sort of in my, my, my book here, Understanding Modern Political Ideas, um, when I get to the part about sort of renewing the American Republic, I really stress the idea of decentralization. And one of the ways to, to, to decentralize is to accentuate property rights, right? You know, yeah. to, to strengthen the right of individuals and families with respect to their property. Now, pro you know, um, I think that that is, um, that's really kind of essential to having a Republic. Now there's always going to be some limitations, you know, um, on, on uh, in any of this sort of thing. Uh, if you're going to have, <clears throat> you know, uh, a, a polis at all. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I would say certainly, you know, what, what you're talking about is, is correct. I mean, in a lot of ways, the, the function that your house and your property now gives you shelter, which is important, uh, privacy, um, a certain amount of comfort, um, some level of security, right? I mean, you lock your, you can lock your doors, uh, that often protects your stuff. 
Um, and then also it's an asset, <laughs> right? So, I mean, uh, oddly enough, it's a financial asset, right? That might help you in some uh, you know, sort of financial ways, but you're right. It is limited. <clears throat> I would be, yeah, I think the idea that you can't grow a garden in your own yard is absurd. Uh, but you know, <laughs> I, 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 I would ask the HOA about that. Like, what, what are you guys thinking? Yeah. I mean, I built some planters in the backyard, but okay. I guess. You know, when you, I mean, it's just, it's, well, I mean, we've all heard the horror stories of people in New Jersey or something, you know, I don't live in New Jersey, thank God, mm -hmm. but like people in New Jersey, um, deciding that, you know, the, the front lawn was the place with the better sun or something. And they wanted to grow some vegetables in the front and they, and like, they got fined out the wazoo and they, <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, in one of my homes, uh, the two homes back, I literally did that. I had to go out in the front yard, you know, uh, uh, it was like, nobody said anything to me, but you know, that was I, I don't live in New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. That was God's country. That's right. That's right. Uh, one other, I think, uh, sort of source here. So we talked a little bit about Locke. He's an important philosophical source for the American idea of freedom. Uh -huh. um, the, uh, the idea there, right, is that as rational beings, right, we have inherently liberty that's proper to our nature and proper to, yeah. uh, and something that's a gift of God. And so we should not be deprived of it. Uh -huh. Um, because there's no one, there's no natural right for one man to deprive another of his liberty, right? Uh, right. It can as, only as be done with just cause. That's right. And, 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 you know, not really by an individual, right? I mean, but, but mm -hmm. by the community, I mean, the concept of, of yeah. in, in the constitution, right? Right. That a person can't be deprived of life, liberty, or property. Without due process, without of due law. process, yeah. So in and a state of this yeah, whole thing about you know criteria, right? In state of nature, it's interesting. Locke thinks we do have the right to revenge, which is private justice, right? But he also recognizes that that's a real problem, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. He's like that, that that we're not very good at carrying that out in a just and rational way. Often we go too far. Our judgments are skewed by bias, that sort of thing, or by like, by passion. Right. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, the reason you want revenge is because something horrible has been done to you. That's right. You're probably really angry. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, and when you are, you don't always make the best decisions. That's right. It's really interesting. You think about uh, I'm going to say this incorrectly. It's the Eumenides, I think, is one of the last uh, plays in the cycle uh, Aeschylus has in which um, if it's a uh, oh, um, was it Restes gets uh marries his mother and there's all this sort of bloodletting in it. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, One yeah. of those Greek tragic cycles. Well, what happens at the end is the, is the furies have to be done away with, right? The furies go away behind the hill and they come out as, as the arts, right? Under with this, except with the understanding that now we're going to have a polis that has a system of justice, right? And I think you kind of see something similar. I mean, you need revenge for a good movie plot, right? Uh, that, you know, but as a way of settling justice, it's not the best, right? And so that's where we, this whole idea of this, the political state comes in for Locke, right? And the political state is very narrowly construed. The political state exists for the, for the sake of protecting our natural rights, right? That just sounds, what a beautiful phrase. So well, this is interesting. <laughs> you know, right? What's interesting is this goes, to, this goes to a point with which we're somewhat uncomfortable today. Mm -hmm. And we can argue, I guess, about, you know, whether Locke was right or wrong about a right to revenge. I, I, I don't, I mean, the Bible says, you know, vengeance is mine, right? Sure. Says God. Sure. But, um, but so maybe Locke isn't quite right about that. Mm -hmm. But I think he's intuiting perhaps this idea that, that um, you have a right to justice. Mm -hmm. And right. one of the primary obligations of uh, government is to provide it. Right, is to mediate it, mm. to secure it. Right. Mm. So if indeed Locke, if he's saying like, look, uh, you have a right to justice of some type. I'll call it vengeance, mm. retribution, or retribution something. Retribution would be good. Yeah. Um, you surrender to the custody of the government, to the of the mm. political community, that right as part of an agreement. That's your social contract. Right. Um, which means that government had better provide it that's right. Yeah. right they have an obligation right. to provide it mm -hmm. and um and this is actually why you you 
th- th- this I think is one of the most sort of intelligent um, critiques you you have against contemporary against contemporary government, right? Is mm. is that uh, one of the things they they don't do very well right now? They they just haven't been doing especially well is mediating justice. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it seems that people on both the right and left have have made that critique. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. Um, I think. Uh, yeah. The uh, the the sort of failure to uh, bring about justice, right, um, is uh, you know it's, it's a serious matter, right? Because that's the primary reason that the government exists, right? Um, is to um, really you know protect our natural rights wow. uh right and if they're failing to do that then the the reason for their existence kind of goes away right um and what you know Locke is especially concerned with is that so what you're talking about is sort of like a defect where like your uh dereliction right where the government's being derelict in its duty Locke's very uh most concerned with actually usurpation right where the government goes beyond right protecting natural rights and usurps to itself powers that have not they were not delegated in the social contract yeah well i i think that from a conservative point of view today american Mm -hmm. conservatism one of the things you have is a critique on both counts Mm -hmm. sure right that you have both a usurpation where the government has gone way beyond the social contract Mm -hmm. and its failure to execute the contract the legitimate part of the contract, <laughs> right. right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and when you put those two things together, that's a recipe for, for disaster. And sure. uh, and and that actually, that kind of that's that is the justification outlined in the Declaration of Independence. That's right. That's right. For the yeah. for the separation of the colonies from England. That's right. But it's really important to see it's not it's not that that case is not a case that's anti monarchical. It's uh-huh. not. It's not a radical democracy view, and very importantly, it's not a um, objectless freedom. It's not a disordered freedom. Right. Freedom. Right. What we're saying is, look, there. We we gave you this power, in order that you carry this out. You're not carrying this out, and so for the sake of justice, right, we're going to rebel. Right. That's yeah. not uh, some sort of anarchical view of freedom. Right. That's a view of freedom in which freedom is connected to justice. Right. Uh, which I think goes along with kind of what we've been saying. Right. Is that the American idea of freedom is not uh, anarchy. It's not voluntarism. Right. Um, it's not, you know, being a libertine. Right? Yeah, it's not this sort of this French existentialist um, sort of self-creation. <laughs> right. concept. That's right. That's right. Um, now, uh, there's there's an, uh, one thing you 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 mentioned just a few minutes ago that I want to go back to, because I think it's extremely important, right? Okay. Is the idea that rights, natural rights come from God. Mm-hmm. And, and that that's clearly, that's in the declaration of independence. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and actually it's one of those, it's one of those lines in the declaration of independence that people have become accustomed on certain sides of the political aisle sure. to omitting. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. That's right. Yep. Correct. Right. Um, this idea that rights come from God, not from government is critical. Mm-hmm. And it kind of takes us back to the historical origins of the, the whole movement. What mm-hmm. I want to say is the, the way in which we came to articulate these concepts over centuries. Right. That's right. That's Tracing right. back to the Magna Carta, for example. Right. Very good. Yeah. Yeah which places clear limits on the power of government relative to mm-hmm. the church and, and, and to people. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can even bring in, uh, you know, Antigone, right. With this, right. Where there's the, I mean, this is going way back, right? but uh-huh. is the, is, is, a, is the recognition that there is a law higher than Creon's law. Mm-hmm. Um, the, that there's a, um, you know, and it's so funny, you know, you go back to the Thomas Clarence, uh, <laughs> that's just just on the edge of my political memory is uh, my own personal political memory, right? When Thomas Clarence was get was going through his uh, the hearings, oh, right? Clarence Thomas, yeah, yeah, Supreme yeah, Court Justice, yeah. Supreme Court Justice. Uh, he was going through his uh, hearing nomination hearings, right? And 
you know, one of, you know, there's a lot of things that were going on there, but one of the things that was really um, controversial, right, was his belief that there's a natural law that's prior to the law of the. Of the oh, United. yeah, I remember. I remember. That, like, how they... That's not controversial. That's basic. Uh-huh. Right. If you didn't think that, then the, then the then the war of independence like doesn't really get off the ground. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, our our declaration of, of independence presupposes, right? You know, uh, that there is a law that's beyond, right, the law of the state. Yes, and I, my own view, um, my own view is that the First Amendment is sort of a way. It's one of the ways in which, and it's under assault today, right? First Amendment. It's, public enemy number one uh, for certain <laughs> segments of the sure. population. Yeah. But mm. it seems to me that the First Amendment is an attempt uh, in the Constitution to um, to basically secure the authority of that voice above government. Mm-hmm. Um, because without it, right, you don't have an established church mm-hmm. in the United States. There's no... Right. There's no like Church of the United States. And so if you have this federal government, uh, but you don't have a voice higher than it, mm-hmm. right, th- someone sort of speaking to it, um, then it can become tyrannical, which was the thing that they wanted to avoid. Absolutely. Yeah. Whereas if you've always got this this voice of a, of a God above nature mm-hmm. that can speak in mm-hmm. through the consciences of the people, through... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the, if you can, if you have that, if you secure a place for that, mm-hmm. then you prevent that kind of tyranny. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I think that's a, that's. Um, I think that's very clear. <clears throat> and I think you know the role of the. This is. Uh, I only know a little bit about this, but there uh, historians of the period speak about the role of the churches and preachers in the War of Independence. Mm-hmm. That you know the vast majority. There there were some exceptions, but the vast majority. Um, supported, right, the War of Independence, right, from the pulpit, right? Isn't that interesting, right? It, 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 they preached that this was tyranny, uh, the, what, what they were suffering, and that it was licit and, and even <clears throat> a duty to revolt, right, mm-hmm. uh, against that tyranny. Uh, what? That's a different kind of preacher, right, <laughs> that maybe we know about today. It was, uh, there's sometimes a couple of, this isn't literally true, but uh, or it wasn't literally accurate, but that um, some British newspapers uh, called the War of Independence the Presbyterian War, right? Uh, for, the, for that reason, right? Of course, they're, they're being Church of England men. They don't uh-huh. particularly like them anyway. So, but um, uh, but it was just because the, there was a white the, the, the churches in the colonies, right, did sort of do the function you're talking about. Yeah. Right. Uh, which is, uh, I think, important. So um, yeah, so we have this idea of, of um, we have this idea of perfecting the rational nature, which isn't mm-hmm. something that today people think much about. I wish we <laughs> right. thought about it more. Sure. Um, but but you know, you you just mentioned Presbyterianism, right? The mm-hmm. the Presbyterian War. Mm-hmm. And one interesting thing about Presbyterianism, right, is that it it kind of traces back to the Scottish Kirk, mm-hmm. uh, right. and um, and they. The reason it's called Presbyterianism, a little theological uh, side note here, is that mm-hmm. is that they had a view. They 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 accepted a view. Actually, Saint Thomas uh, argued for this mm-hmm. um, that the distinction between a presbyter and a bishop is juridical, not ontological. Right. Right. And um, and and they so they looked at the pastor of the of each parish. The presbyter of each parish as being as having the authority of an apostle as basically being a bishop mm-hmm. uh, and so they governed they chose to govern themselves at a lower level right rather right. than these di- dioceses with more centralized authority right uh, at the parish level under the authority of a of a local pastor mm-hmm. hence presbyterianism mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> anyway so I mentioned that only because the what's behind this, right, is, is the Scot- other Scottish ideas. Sure. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, there is this Scottish common sense realism. That's and right. I, yeah. That's really an important ingredient for understanding the reasoning yeah, behind yeah. the uh, American Revolution and, um, and our concept of liberty. So can, yeah. can you explain that a little bit? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. The, uh, um, you know, it's probably a little bit of an overstatement, but the, uh, there is, you know, some historians talk about, you know, sort of the Scottish enlightenment, right. And, uh, that's sort of, you know, Scotland to our imagination, you know, we think maybe the movie Braveheart and it's kind of on the edge of our imagination. Right. But, you know, uh, you know, Scotland, especially around Edinburgh, you know, had become a very fairly sophisticated place. If you visit Edinburgh, you can see the, you can see the, the, what was the modern architecture of the day, right? Very clearly. And it's, it's this kind of neoclassical sort of uh, set of buildings, uh, really quite attractive. But yeah, the, the, um, the, you know, the kind of Scottish middle class um, really flourished uh, as part, uh, once it was you know, made fully part of the United Kingdom um, and produced some outstanding you know, intellectuals some of whom were better than others, you know, uh, you know, certainly, um, but, you know, uh, people, um, uh, um, people like John Adams, uh, not John Adams, I'm sorry. Um, who am I thinking about? Adam Smith, uh, uh -huh. Adam Smith, uh, Francis Hutchinson, and then especially Thomas Reed and Thomas Reed in his own time was considered the, be the, the, the primary opponent of David Hume. And interestingly in their own time, most people thought Reed won. Like Hume was like, yeah, he's kind of marginal compared to Thomas Reed, right? If you were growing up at the time when the founders um, were growing up, you would have read Thomas Reed, right? Your dad would have read Thomas Reed if he was a reading man. Um, the, uh, and, that's, and it goes to the, the, you know, the real prominent place of Scottish culture and ideas in the colonies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that was a, that played a large role. Um, Thomas Reed is somebody who's kind of come back into, there's been kind of a resurgent scholarship and interest in, uh, in Thomas Reed. He represents the school called common sense, uh, Scottish common sense realism, which really kind of was the default uh, philosophy in America, right? Uh, for the first generation or two, which is really fascinating to think about. Um, so much so that Supreme Court cases would cite thomas reed right i mean no. that's, that's remarkable right <laughs> yeah know? so what's interesting is that yeah, if you know to ask to ask people today what, mm -hmm. what you would think that they were all humans right i mean <laughs> like right. Yeah. like yeah. You, you how do i know um mm -hmm. everything nothing self-evident right that's right that's right yeah i mean you know hume to remind the audience right hume is mm -hmm. famous for saying even uh, he's critiquing Descartes, right? And he mm -hmm. says, as for myself, uh, I know only that, that I'm a bundle of perception. That's right. That's you know, right. Like, he, doesn't even, he doesn't even grant that, that, that mm -hmm. there's an enduring self, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he doesn't believe that, um, he doesn't believe that we can predict the future on the basis of the past. And mm -hmm. logically, that may be so, right? Mm -hmm. But the point of departure here, really, between Hume and Reed is that, Reed is like, dude, um, come on, you know, <laughs> right. I'll, quote, I'll quote Joe Biden. Come on, man. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, like, I, don't well, we actually live day to sure. day um, on the expectation that the future will be more or less like that's the right. past? It's common sense, right? That's right. Yeah. Maybe like, I can't mm -hmm. demonstrate it logically that that's, that's going to be the case. Mm -hmm. But what else have we to go on but that's the right. way things have always been? That's right. You know, Reed's view on this is really super smart. I think he, you know, what he wants to say is um, if you're not going to presuppose causality, uh, right, then you can't argue anything. Yeah. I mean, right? to the extent you know, that that just argument, have to, argument involves logical causality. That's right. You're just going to have to be quiet. You're just going to have uh -huh. to be agnostic on everything. Right. And Hume isn't actually agnostic on everything. Uh, he's actually sort of assertive and dogmatic in places. Right. Uh -huh. um, uh, moreover, like, you know, Hume concedes that, oh, when I, well, when I leave the library and go out into the marketplace, then I don't think these things at all. Right. And for Reed, sufficient refutation supplied. Right. Yeah. Right. This right. Is, uh -huh. You know, if if you abandon this as soon as you start to interact with, with you the obviously world. don't believe it. That's right. I, I mean, that's 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 the yeah. that is what's that's what's meant by the term uh, performative contradiction. That's right. The performative contradiction, um, and it shows you the kind of the way he thinks about common sense is common sense is that sort of collection of 
really almost unspoken truths, pro proposition, principles, I should say, unspoken principles that make it possible to reason. Uh -huh. right? And, and that, we've, that over time and over experience, we have, ex we have learned what these principles are uh, as a species and passed them on, right? Uh, which is a really, I think, you know, interesting view of knowledge. And I think, you know, probably correct, right? That is, if, you, if, if, if there aren't certain things presupposed in your principles, then your, your ability to reason about anything falls apart. Even your ability to argue against the reliability of reason falls apart, right? Um, so I think you know, that's the, the, hence the common sense view. And one of the things that was important about uh, uh, Scottish uh, common sense realism uh, with respect to American freedom was that um, Reed thought, and it's really interesting because Jefferson doesn't get self-evident from uh, Locke, he gets it from Reed actually, that uh, moral liberty, right? That is our ability to govern ourselves and direct ourselves and thereby become moral agents uh -huh. is self-evident, right? Yeah. It's self-evident that by our nature and by God, and Reed was a Christian and, and talked about God very explicitly, uh, we are free, right? We are, we are self-governing uh, kinds of beings and that this is uh, uh, self-evident, right? To uh, human experience. Right. So self-governing, um, which means that we have certain sort of uh, powers, right? We have certain mm -hmm. capacity to make mm -hmm. choices about our lives. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean absolute license to do anything. Correct. That's why he calls it. Right. Murder. Because if that were the case, then <laughs> right. the concept of punishment wouldn't make any sense. Right. right. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, right, the concept, of, the concept of punishment is predicated on the idea that people are responsible for their That's actions. Right. That's right. And that there are some things they ought not to do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? That there, that in other words, there's something. Not only is it self-evident that people can can govern themselves, but it's self-evident there that there are things that you shouldn't do. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Those are uh, the so these are important concepts, even at the founding. That's right. Yeah. Um, and and I, so I want to just as we, we're getting long in the discussion now. Sure. We're we're probably at about fifty minutes, and and I want to. Um, I want to just think about this one. There's one thing about contemporary, the contemporary situation, and that is mm -hmm. that it seems to me the whole concept of self-evidence is really under assault. Uh, it <laughs> in everything, right? I mean, uh, like gender is no longer self-evident. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, so, what do we say to this? I mean, where do we? Mm -hmm. What's the response? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, I think dialectical engagement, right, w is required, where you push back on whatever concepts are being used, uh, because there are always concepts. There's always words, right, that are being used to justify certain radical conclusions. Right, mm -hmm. it might be ideas about identity. Uh, ideas about identity, excuse me. Uh, it might be ideas about justice, right? Um, I, you know, as a, I kind of like to press on the justice issue, right? Because once you start pressing on that, pretty quickly people say something like equality. Mm -hmm. And then you say, you press equality. Well, why equality? What's good about equality? What do you, what do you mean by equality? Do you actually think that all people are the same? You know, that sort of thing. Uh, on what base, or if you want to say that they all have the same value, like on what basis do they have value, right? If, if you start pressing on that, right? I think that, you know, the, these sort of progressive utilitarian socialist um, sorts of movements can't hold up under that pressure. Mm -hmm. Eventually they're going to have to appeal to some kind of self-evident principle, right? Um, and then you can ask, you know, whether or not that principle is sufficient to the task, you know, principles, can be examined. They can't be demonstrated, but they can be examined. Mm -hmm. uh, they can. You can see if the principle leads to some sort of contradiction, in which case, right, it's uh, reductio ad absurdum. Or you can show that it's ill-defined, uh, or you can show that it's not really sufficient to ground your reasoning in. Uh -huh. right? I think that's really the Reedian test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Right. I think you can show a lot. You could show sometimes a principle is void of actual content. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't really mean anything, right? You just, you appeal to it. And when I, when I ask you for a <laughs> definition, you just don't have one. That's right. That's right. Um, and, and that happens a lot, actually, sure. right? We, we get used to hearing certain, certain words. They, they, they make us feel better, but they don't really mean anything. Mm -hmm. yep. And I think you can show that sometimes the principle is not suited to the task mm -hmm. uh, for which you appeal to it. Right. Right. You want this principle to do something for you. Mm -hmm. And it, it actually doesn't. I think it's, yeah, it's, uh, I think you're right about that. And, I, and as I say, I think contemporary arguments about justice, you know, uh, push in that direction. Arguments about freedom, you know, um, end up kind of, uh, I think, uh, in a similar way, like you end up with kind of vacuous, right, <laughs> um, uh, concepts or empty concepts. Um, and, and I, but, you know, I, I think the idea of American freedom, right, which is, I think, under assault kind of from both the left and the right, um, but more maybe from the left, um, isn't one of those, right? I think it's well-grounded in a view of human nature. Uh -huh. uh, it's well-grounded in history, right? Um, it's well-grounded in our experience. And if you really understand, you know, what it is and what, you know, the, the American ideal is um, here, um, it's ordered liberty, right? Is, uh, I would, you know, is what I'd call it. Uh, sometimes you could call it self-governance. Um, very often you see the founders use the term self-governance. Um, and that is, you know, free choice to be sure, but free choice under, right, law and custom. Uh, and that law, including the natural law, right? Um, so that, you know, we're free to do good all day long, <laughs> right? You know, we're free to pursue various uh, good things, you know, uh, the virtues and all things that are in keeping with the natural law. Um, but we are not free, right? Even in the American ideal, to do evil, right? Um, yeah. So, so you're you're at liberty, right, mm -hmm. under the American Constitution as originally construed, I suppose. Sure. Um, you're at liberty, right, to govern your life within certain parameters. Mm -hmm. But actual freedom, mm -hmm. I think, is 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 something interior. Sure. Uh, in this idea, right? You're truly free when you're virtuous. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, you know, there's different levels at which you can talk about it. I think at the political level, the constitution and, and, you know, the, the colonies, what the colonies wanted was a broad space for the public exercise of freedom, right. And liberty, uh -huh. right. They didn't want, it's not that they wanted anarchy. They didn't want no law, right. No RK, but they wanted just enough. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, to give and they wanted to be clearly right. defined. That's right. And very exercised <laughs> That's within right. within very, very strict boundaries. That's right. right. But not because they were libertines, but because they thought that virtue, right, and happiness, genuine happiness is brought about through the exercise of ordered liberty. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I think I think that's absolutely that's absolutely right. Uh, so this is actually this is the interesting stuff. And, um, and I think we do well as a society to think a lot more about it mm -hmm. and to maybe sort of relearn some of the, some of the things that once upon a time people might've been taught in school mm -hmm. and really aren't anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's true. I have, I had I, in my earlier studies, I didn't spend a lot of time uh, on sort of American, you know, uh, ideas. I spent most of my time, you know, studying medieval and ancient things. But mm -hmm. over the years, I've come to recognize this is a lot more here that's worth studying. And as, just as we're wrapping up, you talking about the same thing that, you know, we ought to learn in schools. I've got this passage I just want to read from John Adams sure. it's a, on the last page of my book. Um, but it shows you and illustrates, I think, perfectly the kind of freedom that the American founders uh, had in mind. Okay. <clears throat> it says, this is a quote from John Adams' uh, letter to uh, the Massachusetts militia. It said, while our country remains untainted with principles and manners which are now produced, which are now producing desolation in so many parts of the world, while she continues sincere and incapable of insidious and, and impious policy, we shall have the strongest reason to rejoice in the local destination assigned us by Providence. But should the people of America once become capable of that deep simulation, deception, towards one another and towards foreign nations, which assumes the language of justice and moderation while it practices iniquity and extravagance, 
It displays in the most captivating manner the charming pictures of candor and frankness and sincerity while it is rioting and raping and insolence. This country will be the most miserable habitation in the world because we have no government armed with the power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Right? Very clear there, right? right? Yeah. You know, directed by morality and religion. Listen to this. Avarice, ambition, revenge, or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. That's a powerful, I think, passage from Adam. Yeah, it, it is. And everyone, everyone should be made to memorize it. In the- <laughs> <laughs> I agree. It, it just demonstrates that their idea of freedom was not anarchy. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Very clearly. Right. Well, that's a great last word, I think. Uh, it's, a, it's a great place to leave off. So for our audience, thanks for joining us. Uh, for Dr. Smith, thanks for thanks for uh, for having this discussion with us, My and um, and thanks for your book. Thank you, sir. Uh, everyone should run out and buy one. <laughs> yes, um, they should. <laughs> and uh, tell us again the title. The title is uh, Understanding Modern Political Ideas, right? A guidebook for Christians and other patriots. Available wherever fine books are sold. That's right. And um, thanks for joining us. And don't forget to like and subscribe and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>